Ready, steady. I am, I'm ready. <laughs> Christmas. My favorite. Welcome to our very first Focus Friday. I am super excited to start our Focus Fridays off and we are starting off with Jasmine from Jazz Up The Plans. Jasmine is a recently appointed Happy Planner Squad member and a lover of rainbows and an amazing mum to two. Do you want to welcome yourself as well a little bit Jasmine? Yeah, that all sounds really awesome, actually. Um, yeah, I am 25. I'm a mom of two. I love rainbow art, just like in general, happy planner. Uh, this is really exciting being on the squad this year. And I also enjoy Procreate, so I make rainbows and Procreate too, so. Perfect. <laughs> So we're going to start off with a bit of a word association, um, just an icebreaker. And uh, you've got just one second to respond with the first word that comes to mind. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Summer. Uh, Pen. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Rainbow. Love. <laughs> Planning. Love it. <laughs> Joy. Happy. Burgers. Yum. Christmas. My favorite. <laughs> Snacks. Rice crispy. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like Rice crispy snacks too. <laughs> we were just talking about those yesterday. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's get into some stuff about you. Tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, kind of where you got started all right well i am originally from new york city right now i'm living in virginia with my fiance and our two kids but i grew up in new york city in harlem for a good amount of my life up until about 21 and that's pretty much um that's like my life there and then here i'm just a stay-at-home mom and I started planning to sort of give myself an identity. I didn't really know many people here, so would also to connect to other people. So that's what I'm doing, just kind of winging it, <laughs> figuring it out. Fair enough. Um, so you, you got into planning um, just kind of to organize it a little bit more. Um, well, what kind of planning style, what, what makes your planning style uniquely you? Well, yeah, I started planning because my life was a mess. So I started like really functional and like a mini happy planner. And then I got a vertical planner and it made way more sense after I had my second child and needed more space and everything. And so what really got me to stay was I saw, um, I saw Create with Rowley. She did like a rainbow spread and I did one and I was like, whoa, like this is cool. It was like a good balance of functional and rainbow. And so that's where I really focus. I use all of the stickers, but I still write down, you know, my daily to do's and things like that. Where do you even come up with these ideas? Cause I've seen your spreads and they are stunning. So I do something that I don't think a lot of people do. And I actually watch and consume a lot of things outside of like happy planner so i watch you know like your videos and i watch art journaling videos things like that and then i bring it back to happy planning so if i see someone paint something i'll try to see like what in my stickers i can turn into a spread and that's how i get my inspiration and it's like it's really fun because it's like you think more outside the box that way you know that's true and you've come up with some really beautiful spreads <laughs> it's going through your feed it's like a feast for your eyeballs <laughs> Ooh, so pretty. <laughs> so talk to me about a little bit more around some of the challenges you've faced with kind of building your brand and your Instagram and stuff um, as a woman of color. Well, I mean, at the beginning, I don't think I really noticed it much, but I will say it was um, definitely hard finding like myself and the brand. I mean, even in Happy Planner itself, like um, it's hard like to see yourself as a black woman in the brand. And so it was hard to figure out where I fit in in that space. And recently it's also been sort of um, balancing, you know, like the positive vibes and also being an activist and speaking out about Black Lives Matter and things like that. And 
that's sort of been the challenge is still enjoying, you know, being on the squad and um, being myself, but also, you know, telling people that it also does matter in the play and the kind of community, like representation does matter even in our hobbies and things like that. And so that's what we, what's what I've been doing lately. Um, and it's been well received, I think, um, a lot, a lot better than I thought it would go. So it's, yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. How have, how has being selected for the Happy Planner Squad, how has that impacted you and kind of changed kind of the way you use your platform or kind of the, how has it impacted you? Well, it's, it's weird because every step of applying for the squad has been the opposite of what I usually do. <laughs> so I'm usually someone who's very introverted, who avoids all of the spotlight. And so the application this year was to do a video. And I don't think me two months ago would have done that. So I've definitely stepped out my comfort zone, I think, every step of the way. And so being on the squad sort of like helped me find my voice more. And it's definitely why I was able to you know, speak out a lot more than what I usually would. So I, I like it. I like it. And definitely, I feel like when I got accepted for the squad, I did tell myself that whether I got accepted or not, that I would be myself and still do the same thing. And so I've definitely brought that into it. And since I am black, <laughs> and that is obvious, I feel like it's important to also use that platform to discuss, you know, those same topics and make it relatable, you know, but something that people can understand um, on, you know, in the planner community, so. Tell me a little bit about your life and your family history and kind of where you've come from and where you are now. Well, uh, my family history. So I, I said I grew up in New York. Um, at 14, I was diagnosed with cancer. And so that was a big part of my life for about three or four years. I was in treatment and I had just graduated a middle school and like a month later I was in the hospital and I was, yeah, it was, it was a wild, like a wild ride. But, you know, I feel like I've always been pretty much a positive person because when the doctor came in and diagnosed me, I immediately asked if I was still going to school in September. So that obviously didn't happen, but you know, I was pretty positive and, you know, during that, um, I also found my love for creating like the hospital I was at, they had a lot of programs for kids to do all kinds of crafts and things like that. And that's definitely what got me through. And so I've sort of like brought that into my my adult life too. It's just um, when I became a mom and I didn't know what was going on, I turned back into crafting and, you know, being creative. I think that's really important to have something that's for yourself and I, try to you know teach my kids the same thing and yeah yeah I think it's important to have an identity you know outside of just our roles in relation to other people and so that's my life right now just sort of figuring that out for myself that's really that's a really positive message around self-care as well and you know really bringing in that concept of doing those things for yourself and that's you know that one identity that you're known by you know mum, you know business woman whatever it is is <laughs> it's not the only one that's there for you <laughs> all right tell me a little bit about a time when you were treated differently because of your skin color well um so yeah um Recently, I think as a mom, I think I felt it the most. Growing up in New York, it was kind of weird because you're already like trained to not avoid those situations, but handle those situations. So it's more more difficult to sort of pick them up because you're already like prepared to like not enter those kind of spaces. But I, I live in the South now, and so people are a lot more bold, I guess. So um, when I had my daughter, I mean, her father is Puerto Rican, but he looks white, so she's definitely lighter skin. And so when I had my daughter, we went to one of her first appointments and the lady just boldly asked me if she was actually my child. And if I was sure that she was my child after I responded, and I'm like, I think I would remember. So that's definitely a moment that sticks out in my head a lot. Um, even when we had our, like, had our son, we uh, went up to rally for a weekend. And, you know, we were getting breakfast in the hotel breakfast and the lady came over. It was just me and the kids sitting there. 
and she just she was very rude but when my fiance came over you know she calmed down and i, I definitely know that it's because you know she assumed he was a white man and she tried to tell him to like put me in my place and it just got really uncomfortable really quickly and um yeah it was it was pro it was definitely it's hard because most of those situations are with my kids and it's you definitely want to shield them from those kinds of things but um they have to i have to teach them how to use their own voice and stand up for themselves if they're in those situations as an adult as well you know so if you could go back and talk to your younger self what are some of the things you would potentially tell yourself um a few things i would tell myself is one is that um the correct path which i guess is like you know grow up college xyz is not the only path um i definitely struggled with that a lot i went to college for a year and just you know financially i couldn't afford to finish and i struggled that for like a few years of just like feeling like i didn't belong in a certain space because i wasn't following a certain like a specific direction and that is probably the main thing is just you know as long as you're living you know your truth and what makes you happy then that is the most important, you know. I was told I wouldn't be able to be a mom because of the cancer treatment and I proved that wrong twice and like that definitely like makes me more happy than just sort of following the road that's supposed to be, you know what I mean, societal standards and everything like that. So true. You know, we've been going through a lot of changes at the moment. Um COVID-19, uh the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, what are some of the things you've done to navigate that at the moment? Well, COVID we were kind of prepared for because we didn't have a car for a few months and we ironically got our car a week before everything locked down. <laughs> so, we were kind of prepared like mentally we had already sort of experienced the like being at home. And so, it I guess the car helped because we could just go to the grocery store and things like that, but we were sort of prepared for that. and then black lives matter for me is not new for the community for you know the larger community it definitely is but sort of um i guess still finding joy i think people uh i think the like last two weeks people have been angry and i think people need to realize like you can be outraged you can be angry but you still have to you know find something that makes you happy and so When I did my, you know, my spread for Black Lives Matter, it was sort of like the combination of both. Like I can still speak out but also do something that I enjoy. And that's sort of how we've been getting through it. Like, yeah, we might be able to not go here, but we can still make the most of it and, you know, I think it's important, you know, just to find joy in all of this this chaos <laughs> that's going on. That's so true. Um you've spoken out quite a bit on your social media about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. It's kind of what prompted me to contact you. Um you've had an amazing response. Some of those comments have been so kind and so lovely. What are some of the key messages you'd hope people take away? One of the key messages is that it's not a trend. I mean, Black Lives Matter alone has been around for the past 6 years. and i think it's definitely amazing that this sort of round of it that um everyone is more aware um and is educating themselves but i think definitely that it's something that you have to do both online and offline um you know i was definitely skeptical at first when i saw people talking about it online only and so i feel like if you are bringing it you know you have to still you can't always look for the reward in it and that might be getting lost in the message you don't have to post every single thing you're doing for black lives matter um that's probably my main message you know like being an activist offline and offline i think is very important right now it's i think it's the only way that it'll be true change and not just like a surface of people you know being more accepted i mean black lives matter is more than just you know violence and people you know police killing people it's it's about black people being able to live the same uh quality of life feeling yeah <laughs> it's yeah. across the board right exactly exactly you know being able to enjoy you know planter land without worrying about getting followed in the store at Michaels or things like that things like that simple as that and so 
yeah, you definitely have to, it has to be all over. So that's, that's probably my biggest message. And that's definitely why I chose, you know, to say that it's not a trend. It has to be something embedded in your life where it shouldn't even be like a conversation, you know, hopefully by the time all our kids are older, you know? So true. I, I keep saying that it's a, that it's a marathon. We're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon, you know, yeah. take it day by day and let's just keep making change as much as we possibly can. Right. Um, so you've got a mom, you're a mom of two. How has, how has been explaining and working through not only COVID, but you know, Black Lives Matter, how has this been with them? How have you gone through the process with them? Well, I mean, in one way I'm lucky because my kids are really young, so they don't watch the news or anything like that. But um, like my daughter's three and you know, kids, three years old now have tablets and all those things now. <laughs> so um, one thing is that uh, um, she's watching a lot of Barbie and obviously Barbie is white. So <laughs> we definitely have to have, um, we try to have a good balance. I mean, the toys we buy her, we usually buy her toys that look like the people around her. So black Barbie and uh, or tan Barbie and whatever Barbie, things like that. And um, it's something my mom did and I didn't, I don't think I understood as a child, but you know, she's like, we, she talked to me the other day and she was like, my daughter, and she was like, oh, like Barbie's so pretty. And I'm like, you're pretty too. Like, and I just constantly remind her that, you know, you can find someone else pretty, but also find yourself pretty. I think that's um, definitely a conversation that we're having now is that you don't have to be, you know, blonde and white to, to be pretty. You can be, you know, everyone is pretty. And I think that's where it starts. I think that the conversations don't have to be you know, so intense, it just, you know, accepting everyone. And I think once you start having those conversations earlier, it won't have to be like such a big thing of worrying about why everyone is so different. And it's definitely a conversation we have here, you know, constantly and consistently. I mean, I tell her every day to look in the mirror and be like, I'm beautiful, I'm smart, I'm amazing. And so that's how we're starting here. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> Yeah. Anything you would want to share with other parents? Um, other parents, I mean, that obviously, and then also um, the conversation about not seeing color. I think it's like, it's a nice thing to say, but it's, I don't think it's the right way to go about it. I think you definitely have to see color. I mean, you have to see some what, who someone is in order to understand what they're going through. So I think you know, saying I don't see color kind of implies that you don't see the person. And so I think when you're having those conversations with your kids, you can obviously say, you know, like, you know, she's black or he's black, but their life might be a little harder. But if you're doing your part, then it might be a little easier. And I think that's where it goes. I think that's a message that definitely needs to kind of like fade into the background that don't see color part and definitely teach your kids to see other people for who they are and, you know, just treat them the same as they want to be treated. What is one thing you wish you could tell people um, to make them more aware about racism and how to combat it within themselves? Um, I would say be open to uh, criticism and be okay with messing up. Um, uh, even myself, I mean, I'm black, but I don't speak for all black people and I haven't experienced every black person's experience with racism. and so. It's always like, you know, a learning curve. I mean, even my experience as a black woman is different from a black man. So I think being open to, you know, doing the research, hearing criticism um, and just learning and not always being on the defense. I think that's that's what I'm learning. And I think it has to be, you know, both sides. So the con it, talking, I only see talking, not being afraid to make a mistake. Everyone's going to make a mistake. and just take the advice and, you know, grow from it. I think that's probably the most important thing in this whole, this whole situation, you know? Fair enough. Um, as you know, one of the things we're doing for Focus Friday, um, any of the advertising revenue from the YouTube video and also from the blog, we're donating that to an organization of your choice. Which organization have you chosen? And could you tell us a little bit about them? So I've chosen the Oprah Project. It is a Please. organization that donates, oh, not, not donates, that um, they hire trans, black trans chefs to cook 
for black trans people and so it they the people they cook for don't have to pay for it and they cook into their you know they come into their homes and they cook for them and you know i just I chose it because, you know, even myself growing up, I definitely dealt with not knowing um, when, when our next meal was. And so it definitely broke my heart to hear that trans people, being trans, being black is definitely hard. And so not even knowing, you know, when your next meal is just because you want to live your own truth, like that's painful. And the, the organization, they also, if you're homeless, they bring the food to you. I mean, it's wonderful. And you know people were just kinder to each other this world would be so much better and i that's why i chose the okra the okra um program so i think people should i think uh if people can help out with that i think that'd be amazing you know just starting with a meal and food is community so you know eating and sitting around and talking i mean it's community so that's why i chose the okra project that sounds like a lovely project <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm so glad I now know about it as well. Like I, I didn't know about it up until now and it sounds fantastic. Yeah. So to wrap up, I really want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate you being here and having the candid conversations with me this as well. Awesome. So really appreciate it. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. This was amazing. This was my first interview. I'm so excited. This is, <laughs> this is great. <laughs>